Larkin Square this week. Plus, why were all the artists that ki I kissed the Amarillo wearing Bills jerseys? Judd's here. He's got your answers in Tuesday, Tuesday. It's 9 a.m. in Buffalo. Time for Winging It Buffalo Style. Good morning. Welcome to Winging It Buffalo Style. Hope your Tuesday's off to a nice start. I'm Lauren Hall. And I'm Matt Snyder. And I have to say, I always love when we have unintentional matching days. Yeah, it always we're... sets the mood right, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's Turquoise Tuesday, Tan Winging It Buffalo Style. It's also Food Truck Tuesday. That's why the Pizza Amore wood burning food truck, wood fire food truck, is parked outside, ready to go with some more delicious pizza pies for us. We're going to be outside in just a little bit, cooking things up with them. They'll be at Larkin Square. And another thing that will be at Larkin Square, we'll take a look at these unbelievable chalk jarrings that are being created as we speak by an artist from T Toronto. You'll definitely want to bring it, your family down to see this art being created right as we speak. That is not the correct video, but we will have that for you coming up later in the show. What you are looking at is some more great Father's Day ideas for the history buffs in your family. We will take you to the Buffalo Transportation Pierce Aero Museum. Maybe your dad's a car guy. Great destination for Dad's Day coming up. I think a lot of people might have been thinking, wow, that's a really realistic <laughs> chalk drawing that's showing drawing. us right now. <laughs> for sure. Hey, we're winging it as always. We want to let you follow up on some stories that we did last week that we talked all about the Congress for New Urbanism, and we have some numbers to share with you this morning to kick things off. The Congress chose Buffalo for its opportunities in urban development and community planning. We brought you inside the conference last week to let you know a little bit more about their goals. Now we're hearing from Visit Buffalo Niagara. They're reporting that 1,300 out-of-town attendees visited Buffalo last week and left behind an economic impact north of $2.5 million. Quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, they were great. You, you had a chance to speak to them right here in the studio. I had a chance to speak to them on location. And, you know, everybody involved in it from people that came into town for Buffalonians too. Everyone just had a great buzz about them. And not only do they leave behind those economic numbers thanks to the tourism, but they're also started some groups that we're going to continue to see improvements all around the city from from those groups. So there'll be some lasting impacts for sure. Excellent. Well, now we're moving from DC, er, from Buffalo to DC. There's one buff. Er, there's one basketball player that had quite the trip. UConn's championship winning basketball team visited the White House, but one of the women's player, one of the woman players, didn't quite have her on court balance. She took a tumble getting back on the risers right in front of the president, but the president gave her a hand getting back up and she was a very good sport about it. If you watch the video, you can notice, I think right about here, she does a little curtsy, they smile, they joke about it. I think she handled this fall definitely with grace. This was something that apparently had been in the works since last year. UConn women's basketball is pretty much a dynasty. They consistently win the championship, so they had been the year before. And she told Obama, or he told her, one of the two, if we come back again next year, let's have a dance off. Let's have a dance party. So I think she was trying to initiate that dance party. Didn't go so well, but she still made it into the headlines and, like you said, handled it with grace. Looked beautiful, so I'm sure she's not upset this and morning. Can you imagine how nerve-wracking it must be just to stand near the president? It. Not alone. Like, then you're on stage, and then you have to interact. I would have tripped. I would have tripped and probably fallen fa or face first, right on my face. Such an exciting day, though, for the Huskies that they got to go. The men's and women's, of course, both won the championships this year, so they both got to go together. Pretty history-making day at the White House. Nerves or not, maybe it helps them that they were all together. You know. <laughs> and lesson learned: if you do trip in front of the president, just handle it with a, a little curtsy. Just laugh it off. <laughs> He's seen it before. He's used to it. You won't be the first one now. Well, hey, everyone's going to be talking about soccer. We're heading into FIFA World Cup. There's been so much anticipation building for this tournament. We're learning a little bit more about how the referees will call the games in a game as fast paced as soccer. It can get confusing when you have to make calls. That's why FIFA has decided to allow the use of a German technology. This is called goal control. It actually allows the referee to wear a special watch that vibrates and sends notifications when the ball crosses the goal line. I mean, this is unbelievable. My question when I heard the story is why don't we use it for every other sport that has a goal? I mean, hockey's I also fast too. paced. Football apparently can detect any ball, not just soccer balls. I feel like this is a technology that maybe we should start utilizing elsewhere. It doesn't, if it says that they will permit it, it doesn't sound like it's going to be mandatory so the referees can choose to do it. It's got to talk about pressure. I mean, to be able to, to have to call a game that the entire world is watching, you don't want to make any mistakes. And if you have something to back it up, 
I guess it can't hurt. I don't know. I have to say, I think this is something that, you know, when we do a little more research, we'll find out about it. If you're interested in it, maybe then some cons will come up. But as of now, I can't see why anyone else would want to do that. And of course, if you're talking about soccer, our web producer, Emily Lanahan, is going to have a lot more on this coming up in her first .com check. It is just interesting thinking about it being the World Cup. This is German technology, all these different ideas coming together in one place. So maybe there'll be some benefit to that. Yeah, so if you hear a lot of people talking about football, they're not talking about the Buffalo Bills, <laughs> they're talking about soccer. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> All right, why don't we send it over to our web producer, Emily Lanahan, for, or actually, sorry about that. We're switching gears because we want to talk about Father's Day. If your father or someone in your life is a history buff or loves the automobile, we've got the perfect way to spend your day. With Dad this weekend, we're checking out the Buffalo Transportation Pierce Arrow Museum. Let's take a look. From two wheels to four wheels, from pedals to motors, the Buffalo Transportation Pierce Aero Museum has made it their mission to showcase and preserve Buffalo's history of getting people from point A to point B in style. The museum was founded in uh, 1997 as a not-for-profit 501c3 to house pretty much a collection my wife and I have put together over the years. And since that time, a number of cars have been donated and memorabilia and things like that. And we've expanded the building recently from 20,000 square feet to almost 60,000 square feet. Within those 60,000 square feet, museum goers will see a vast collection spanning the history of transportation, a history rooted right here in Western New York. Our mission is to celebrate the history, automotive uh, transportation history of Buffalo, starting with carriages and then bicycles and uh, automobiles, motorcycles, travel trailers, anything made in Western New York. Buffalo was very prominent in the automotive industry and transportation history because of the Erie Canal and the proximity to power at Niagara Falls. A lot of uh, German, especially German immigrants came up the Erie Canal and decided to settle here because of the water power and the electric power and they were machinists. So they loved to make carriages and motorcycles and bicycles and all the things that we were famous for. One name synonymous with the history of the automobile and Buffalo is Pierce Arrow. But don't worry if that doesn't ring a bell. The staff here will be happy to give you a history lesson. George Pierce uh, started right after the Civil War at the uh, right at the terminus of the Erie Canal, right where the Skyway is right now, and all the concerts are. That was the first plant, and they were making uh, bird cages and ice boxes from Civil War time till the 19, 1890s. 1890s, they began to make bicycles along with their other items. And by the time of 1900, uh, the Pan American Exhibition, they started to make automobiles and went on to make motorcycles, travel trailers, and trucks till 1938. Combining Buffalo's legacy in transportation and architecture is the Frank Lloyd Wright Buffalo Filling Station, which was designed in 1927 but never actually built, but can now be seen right here in the museum. In 1927, Frank Lloyd Wright was in financial trouble and Darren Martin said uh, in order to pay back Darren Martin and other people he owed, why don't you design a filling station, an up-to-date filling station? With more Americans traveling than ever before, Wright set out to revolutionize filling stations, which at the time would consist of a gas pump and outhouse. He was uh, gonna put comfort station and have a living room, much like Delta Sonic and other companies have right now. He was gonna put a fireplace inside uh, under a thousand gallons of ga uh, gasoline tank. Uh, just all these forefront things, the neon, use of neon and the use of copper, all the roof, everything was made of copper. It wasn't just design elements that made this filling station unique. The use of gravity feed, instead of an attendant pumping the gas out of the ground, he was going to put the tanks in the air in the eaves and let the gas flow down through what he called bells. Unfortunately, the Frank Lloyd Wright filling station was never built, and the design spent years gathering dusk in a desk drawer, until about 11 years ago. And after years of hard work, the filling station can now be seen at the Buffalo Transportation Pierce Arrow Museum, just in time for Father's Day. Father's Day is a big, big day for us. Actually, it's the weekend because what we do is allow people to bring dad for free on Saturday and Sunday of Father's Day weekend, and we expect uh, thousands of people. We're gonna give a sneak preview of the Frank Lloyd Wright filling station and that people who come in are gonna be able to see that for the first time.